Well, welcome once again to Art Break, everyone. Uh, well, coming up next month, November 1st, is the celebration of the Day of the Dead, which I'm sure many of you know is a Mexican tradition, which is a way of inviting those who have passed on to return, at least in spirit, and share once again with the living. Uh, one of the most important or key parts of the, uh, this um, ceremony is the ofrenda. And this is a temporary altar uh, dedicated to a loved one. And you can see an example right in front of you that uh, we'll hear more about later that traditionally includes things such as photograph candles and the loved one's favorite foods, as well as traditional decorations. In 2022, our guest today, Margaret Vega, was invited by the Grand Rapids Public Museum to create an ofrenda for her late father, uh, Francesco. And Francesco Vega, by all accounts, uh, led a remarkable life. Among other things, he was an important figure in the Latino civil rights movement and later became an advisor to a number of presidents going as far back as John F. Kennedy. Um, Margaret Vega has her own distinct accomplishments. Um, she is the Professor Emeritus at Kendall College of Art and Design in Grand Rapids, where she taught, among other things, painting, drawing, color theory, and design. She is also an artist uh, in her own right and uh, has exhibited both nationally and internationally. While she is primarily a painter, she has worked in other medium and is also a furniture designer. One of Margaret's other accomplishments was the founding of ArtLink GR, which offers children in the Grand Rapids area uh, quality art programs within their own community. And the idea behind this program was to um, involve children um, to find solutions through experimenting and play, and also draw in projects that uh, used history and creative thinking. So being both an artist and art activist and daughter, it makes Margaret the perfect person uh, to honor her father's legacy. And we're delighted that she's here with us today to share that experience with us. So please welcome Margaret Vega. Well, thank you for those kind words, and also to Miriam and the Kalamazoo Institute for Arts for inviting me to speak today. Um, I'm going to be talking about the ofrenda that I created for my father, who died uh, in 2021, um, called Borrowed Light, um, honoring him, Francisco Miguel Nava Vega Lopez Tapia. That's a long name, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I'll be also talking about the design and selection process of creating an ofrenda, both with, with traditional means and non-traditional means. As an artist, I, I think I bent a few of those rules to, or at least um, enhanced a few of those rules. I'd like to speak first um, about how I approached the ofrenda as an artist. Um, it, it coincided with my work at the time because I was doing a lot of installation work and the ofrenda became an installation. It also was a very cathartic process for me as I was uh, grieving my father. So this is not the exact ofrenda because the one in the museum was an entire room. So this is a very edited version set up very quickly, um, but I think it gives you the idea of how we can select objects that remind us of the person that has departed. So I'm gonna just talk a minute about being an artist and going through this process because I imagine some of you are artists as well. And so you understand that this is an, an editing process. This was a man that lived a hundred years of a very uh, rich life that I had to select and edit what would be appropriate and interesting for an ofrenda. So as an artist, I naturally arrange things. If you're a painter or anyone that works with color, you're constantly rearranging color, working out compositions, uh, spaces, objects, 
everything I see always has a relationship or is in context to something else. So this also became about storytelling. What was next to something else became a story. Um, and I guess in the spaces, almost like poetry, I was hoping that people could have their own dialogue, sort of conjure up their own memory of someone. Um, documenting our investigations with image or object is intrinsically tied to our intimate knowledge of something. As artists, we've used image as a carrier of insight, as a blueprint to how we understand our world, to explain what we see and hopefully what we cannot. Um, my hope is that this ofrenda will share a relatable truth, a homage to an elegant man of vision and intellect, a leader, mentor, and a friend who is also my father. A father and a man who not only changed my life, but the lives of many. When I was asked last year, and again, those of you that are artists can relate to this, um, by the Grand Rapids Public Museum to do an ofrenda, I had several other big shows kind of for me, big shows kind of on the docket. I had work I had to complete, I had to create, I had to ship, um, but I thought I can do this, 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 no problem. Some fruit, a few candles, a photograph, um, one month at the most to assemble everything. Mm -hmm. Um, so then last May, I began going through boxes at my parents' house. My mother's still alive and they lived in their house until he died in preparation for an end of August install. And boy, did I underestimate the time that I would need. Um, I started making drawings in my sketchbook first of, of the, what the ofrenda might look like. And at that point, there was a little self-awareness that I was also examining as an artist this space and these objects and would this even look good on an ofrenda, right? Um, I was still pretty underwater following my father's passing. And as I started sorting through things into piles and the piles grew, I began to have a vague understanding of what I wanted the story to be. Um, the objects started forming relationships and a linear sense of history began to evolve. I learned that I could not just put food in a museum, that they have all kinds of rules of what kinds of things can go in a museum, and food was not one of them. So I had to learn how to shellac and seal food that passed the ant test, and I had several ones, little tests on chocolate outside of my studio that definitely did not pass. So I also um, had to, to, well, I came to learn that clothing had to be freeze-dried. So I had these beautiful, um, pieces of clothing from my father because he he did, uh, he actually created the first Hispanic festival in Grand Rapids. So I had that original clothing and it all had to go into deep freeze before I could put it on the ofrenda. I found myself painting brown spots on plastic fruit and putting stickers on them so they looked real. Um, borrowed light was created absolutely in the voice of my father and was a journey that took many months systematically arranging things. It was a path of discovery um, about learning about my father's life. I opened boxes and I found pictures of him in the Oval Office and letters from presidents that I had never seen before. So, of course, I wish that he was there so I could ask him the story behind these. But thankfully, he was a saver and I had a, a lot of a lot of notations. I, I had to edit with the museum a um, 100 years of his life. And it began when he was very young. Um, and I also wanted to tell the story that I thought he would want to tell. And I felt throughout the process, he was in my ear going, mm -mm, yeah, that's a good one. That, that was a good party. We should put that one in. I continued to work on the painting that was in my studio called Song of the Bluebird. Um, I do have some images of it. I didn't bring it here today. And other paintings that, as I said, I had to finish and create for various exhibitions. All the, all the while in my studio, surrounded by these piles of my father's things, which is not how I work at all in my studio. It was strange, but it was kind of a good strange because I felt like he was there when I was trying to finish all this work. Um, this is actually my second ofrenda that I created in a public space. But on a personal level, um, I created an ofrenda immediately after my father passed in the, in the space where his bed was. Um, and my mom still sits by that ofrenda. Um, 
and she claims that the little glass of tequila is the first thing to evaporate and she just can't figure out why she says she feels in there so i have a little a tequila which i didn't pour into the glass because i don't know what the rules are here but it's it's on the ofrenda um i change the objects depending on the season for a while i change them when trout season opened for him um, and put things out that he might enjoy and i also have one in my home by the window because he always told me he would visit me by a window um, and it has things that I find on a daily basis. Right now, there are some rocks from Lake Michigan, um, a picture of him. Sometimes I'll just drop by some petals from my garden. Um, for me, that, that's kind of a visit with him every day. I said earlier that I like to juxtapose global conversations about my art, and I'm gonna come back to that. After, um, well, after I set this up, I took off for Australia, really needing kind of a break. And I, I uh, took a dreaming walk in the outback. I'll explain what that is in a minute. I discovered that having just set up the ofrenda, that the experience overlapped with my conversation with the ofrenda. So dreaming or dream time, as told to me by an Aboriginal man, is storytelling, usually by the elders, and in Aboriginal culture, it represents a relationship with all things, past, present, and future. So in dreaming, your entire ancestry exists as one. It has no beginning and no end. These beliefs have now been widely assimilated beyond the Australian context to become a part of global culture. And I believe the same is true for the ofrenda and the Day of the Dead. These celebrations now embrace various ways beyond Mexican traditions, and they help us to understand someone that is lost to us. So my life was eclipsed in the moment that my father left this world and transitioned to the next. But I really do believe that we don't die if there are people who remember us and keep our stories alive. I believe now and then our worlds do overlap and he finds a way to be with me. He often said these words to you and those of you that speak Spanish or are familiar with Spanish culture. There's a Spanish song called La Paloma, the dove. And he used to say to me, if a dove should arrive at your window, treat it with care because it is my person, it is me. And I didn't know until after he died, that was from a song. Although I do listen for the dove, as I promised I would, a monarch is his, farm, is his form that I believe visited me. And I think he knew that I would, since I love research, would delve deep into the history of the monarch if a monarch visited me. And of course, that's what I did. And I was surprised what I didn't know about the monarch. So the ofrenda is a pre-Hispanic tradition that started roughly 3,000 years ago with the Aztecs, the Toltecs, and the Mayan civilizations, which overlapped in some of their, their uh, culture. It was seen as a natural part of life to be celebrated. These offerings uh, were typically prepared a few days before November 1st, when it is believed that the dead return to visit their friends and relatives. There are traditional objects in my ofrenda, like the marigold. So the marigold has sort of a pungent fragrance and of course a brilliant color, and it is thought to attract the souls. But I also took some artistic liberties. I used some personal objects to tell his story that I thought he would want there. Um, I also wanted to create a place that he would want to visit, where he would smile and want to stay. So the ofrenda is an assemblage, a still life of carefully arranged objects, each one telling of a life well lived. But it is also the voice of my father with his measured wisdom, his humor, his stories, his singing, delible insight, and sound, these things sounded in my head. I tried to find a tangible object to tell that story as I was editing through all of these, all of these artifacts. So um, a little bit about my father. He was a timeless Renaissance man with relentless curiosity and a vision that really often exhausted all of us. He was deeply invested in his heritage. He grew, he, he, he gathered strength from his ancestors and he 
his values and also um, his relationship with Central, uh, uh, sorry, with uh, General Santiago Tapia, who I, you can see here on the frame. And I'll speak about him in a minute. And I, I know sometimes when you grow up and you're in high school and you hear history over and over again from your parents, it gets a little bit, you're not listening as closely, I guess I will say. And when he passed away and I started finding things about General Santiago Tapia, um, it, it, it was a, a new light for me and a new uh, way of looking at my father. So uh, this historical, narr historical narrative that made him who he was, um, I was fortunate. My father held on to his mind and carried it with him into the next adventure until he let go of my hand pretty much. Um, so in that way, his hundred years of incredible life, I was able to hear a lot of those stories. I feel very fortunate. I saw or talked to my father almost every day for most of my life. He was and is my definition of a hero. He lived life uh, the way he thought it should be lived and to the fullest. He was fly fishing in bed uh, the last few hours in a world that straddled where he was and fearlessly facing the one where he was going. In this universal middle world, or as I learned from my walks in the outback, dreaming stories based on the interrelationship of all people and all things, the shifting states of consciousness, this is what I'm really interested in as an artist um, and made my design decisions for creating this ofrenda. My father had a relationship and deep respect and understanding, harmony with the natural world. He, if I can name a tree or a flower today, it's because I heard him talking about it. He loved beauty and he found it in all the senses, music, architecture, art, design, flowers, landscape, food, uh, the sunset, particularly in Northern Michigan, his orange trees, where he would go like this when they bloomed so that you could inhale the fragrance, a daily poncho, which is a drink that he had since he was a little boy, like 11, every morning, which had a raw egg, milk, vanilla, and a shot of tequila. And you shake it, beat it, cook it up for a second, and that would be his breakfast. And I remember he was in the hospital one time, and he, he asked the doctor, he was probably in his 90s, if he should give that up. And the doctor said, absolutely not. If that's what's keeping you going every day, keep enjoying it. He loved a good Manhattan and he had his own recipe and a beautiful trout stream. He was a fisherman that could stand in a stream all day long. He was a perfectionist, which was interesting growing up with him. He was a historian, very well read, and he often said that he never had a bored moment in his life, and I totally believe that. He embraced life with a hug, taking any opportunity to celebrate, arm up, glass in hand, toasting life. And you can see that's why I put that picture in the middle. We're up on Beaver Island there. In the last months, very typical of my dad going in his own style, he would um, sing a song and I would hear it when I was leaving out the back door. The song is called Adios Muchachos and it is a goodbye song. And he, you know, he knew he didn't have very long, but it's, a, it's about, Thank you for the party. It was great. You know, I had a great time. Everybody keeps celebrating. Um, so if you if you can find it, it's it's a great song. He never lost his absolute smile at life. His passion of living every moment with the potential to create create an impact is probably what I miss the most, and I hope is reflected in this ofrenda. Um, so maybe we can start the slides because I want to start with a little bit of history of, I'm not supposed to walk away, so I'll stay right here. <laughs> um, a little bit of history about the ofrenda. So has anybody been, oh, that's my job. Hang on a minute. <laughs> there we are. This is an ofrenda in Oaxaca. Has anyone ever been to Mexico during Day of the Dead? Okay, so you know, it's, it's an amazing celebration that you will remember forever. Um, the word ofrenda actually is used to refer to the things placed on the altar as an offering. That's what the word translates as. But the whole altar itself is often called an ofrenda. Probably many of you have heard of uh, 
Dia de los Muertos or the Day of the Dead, or maybe you've even seen the movie Coco. Somebody had to point that out to me. I hadn't seen it. So that's, that's worth a look if you haven't seen it. It's an animated version of this tradition. You're perhaps familiar with the sugar skulls, the photos, candles, this colorful cut paper that's used to make an ofrenda. So I just want to take a couple minutes and explain the history, and then you can also see how I deviated from the history a little bit, and the symbolism. Each year at the beginning of November, Mexico is filled with the sights, smells, and sounds of Dia de los Muertos, Day of the Dead. These are celebrations with parades, not just altars in rooms, but altars in the cemetery as well. This holiday is one of remembrance and reunion. Stories of loved ones are shared over um, traditional sweetbread. Families gather by candlelight to arrange their ofrendas and their offerings to the dead. You will um, Very often there's a fragrance of copal incense or, of course, the marigolds that are supposed to coax the souls of ancestors back to the world of the living. So though it's called the Day of the Dead, it's actually two days. The first day um, is when the spirits come and visit us and we celebrate and, and talk about old stories. You honor the spirits. The second day is, is believed when they depart. So I like to think that it's late in the evening on November 2nd so that I can keep them around as long as possible. Of course, they're able to use real candles. And in the museum, I couldn't use real candles. That was another thing on the no list. Um, and there is, I think, this also fragrance of the wax melting in with the flowers. It's, it's really quite remarkable. Uh, so during this time, it's believed that the souls awaken and return to the living world. And they're feasting and drinking and dancing and playing music with their loved ones. Uh, the Day of the Dead celebration, as I said earlier, has its roots in the ancient Aztec culture, but it evolved over years, as you can imagine, with Catholicism and colonialization. Everyone came in and kind of left their stamp on it. Um, in general, death was viewed at the start of a journey to the kingdom of the dead before reaching heaven, and along the way, you had to give little gifts to get to the next level. So... Um, Catholic crosses started to come into play. Um, religious symbols were incorporated. You can see Our Lady of Guadalupe that I put up here, which is a whole different lecture about her and the meaning behind her. I have a great story about that one. Um, regardless of the religious beliefs, uh, the loved ones, it's really about the loved ones that have departed and re having a reunion with them. The ofrenda allows us for a brief moment to inhabit both worlds and understand our past because the departed are connecting with us and teaching us and reminding us about family. The sharing of stories becomes a part of the grieving process. The building, collecting, and placing items on an ofrenda is a cathartic event, a tool to teach us about the person we are honoring and the idea of our ancestors and traditions. So there are also parades, as I mentioned, and these lovely mosaics that are in the streets. Um, and you can see the people that dress up quite elaborately. It's filled, uh, Dia de los Muertos holiday is filled with beautiful symbols, traditions, and imagery. Every detail re represents something significant and special in the remembrance of loved ones. Some symbolism is rooted in the ancient Mesoamerican traditions. Some came from the Spanish Europeans who occupied the area, and some have evolved from over 3,000 years of celebration, like the monarch butterfly, which appears in ancient carvings, much like you would see the cat in Egypt. So it goes way, way back. Um, just a, a brief note about the skeleton, because we see the skeleton, and I saw it driving here, um, kind of getting ready for Halloween. It's not the same as the Halloween skeleton. So Halloween traditions are kind of intended to frighten and have their roots in Ireland and in Scotland, while the Day of the Dead was adapted by the Aztec culture, and the traditions are intended to honor the dead and to celebrate at the cemetery with colorful flowers, singing, and food. 
Mexican costumes at this time are full of symbolism, while Halloween costumes are meant to just be someone or something else for a day. The Day of the Dead skeletons are also intended to be joyful. Um, they're usually full of color, sometimes they're dancing or dressed up, and they can even be comical. This artist that did the uh, woodcut on the right is Posado. I don't know if you're familiar with him. So this is the Day of the Dead bread and some sugar skulls and also some of the cut paper, papel picado, which I'll talk about in a second. But you can see that on top of the bread, there are these little bumps. Those are supposed to be bones. Um, so here is some of the traditional symbolism used in the ofrenda and what they're supposed to mean. Uh, the candles represent light so that the spirits can find us. Uh, the pan de muerto, which is the bread I was just talking about, is covered in sugar and they only make it this one time a year. And it's supposed to be, as I said, has, have bones on the top. The sugar skulls uh, symbolize friends and family and they can sometimes have names on them. So there, here you can see a, a few of the marigolds and flowers set up. Uh, in the next one, some of the religious imagery that has um, been adapted into these uh, ofrendas over the years. And you can also see some favorite food and drinks of the deceased, because you wanna make sure you put not just the traditional things, but something specific that they like, that they would come back and be excited about. Um, I did want to say that every ofrenda usually has four elements in them. So they usually have water, wind, earth, and fire in some form. Each state in Mexico has its own particular way of setting up an ofrenda, um, while others you'll see have different levels. Um, the tiers have meaning as well. They represent heaven, earth, and the underworld. And in very elaborate ofrendas, you might find as many as seven layers or levels. So how to create an ofrenda? Um, I just went through what's, what's involved in the specific symbolism, but you can also add your own things to them. Um, like I said, I swapped out the water for tequila. I figured he would much rather have that when he comes back. But you know, you can put any favorite drink or um, any, any particular object that has meaning to you. And after you select them, um, you can use this also as a sort of a process to grieve and to remember that person. So um, moving on to how this idea came about for the borrowed light homage to my father. Um, I started with a rudimentary sketch that kind of grew like sketches do and changed. Um, and although, I, though I, it may seem a very different direction for an artist, as I said, I was doing installation work already um, based, uh, called Color Me Flesh, basically based on the creation of other by the Creole Crayon Flesh and objects and historical artifacts. I was studying at the um, American Academy in Rome. So I was surrounded by all of these historical artifacts, which have been edited, right? They've been changed. So I was kind of in that mindset when I was pulling these objects too. So as an artist, there was definitely an overlap. Um, I found documents, as I said, letters from presidents, awards in boxes, uh, handwritten census reports. Some of you may not know, but the Latinos were not even counted in the census until the 70s. There was no interest to know how many were here, whether, you know, look, now there's like six boxes you have to check to kind of, as they try to categorize. So the census also came into my, my work as I found those pieces. There was definitely an overlap. My father um, actually was in Washington um, in the 70s, early 70s, to get the Latinos on the census because there were benefits to that, scholarships, uh, loans for businesses, 
that the Latinos did not have. So anyway, all of that, boxes and boxes of things had to be sorted. This is um, all at the Grand Rapids Public Museum now. They've documented all of it and um, it's there for historical purposes. Uh, I was going back and forth with the museum. The computer drawing there is what the museum was putting together. On the side walls, we were trying to figure out how to incorporate and edit with a capital E all of this so that people that come through can get some kind of a historical linear perspective of uh, his life, but not too much. Uh, we designed a table, the specific dimensions that I thought would work, and I wanted to do a couple tiers. So uh, there is that second table there, and there are piles in my studio of objects and things that we're starting to collect and kind of evolve. Okay, so remember I told you I had to prepare things. I had three different plastic corns that I ordered from Amazon that were all horrible. I finally found one that I liked and I took real corn husks and glued them on the top and painted them with watercolor and then ran kind of like a oil brown in the, you know, in the little separations of corn so that they would look a little more real. And then I was putting some experimenting with different glazes and things that I could put on the food and the candy that would keep the ants away and that the museum would approve. Um, so here was the setting for the ofrenda. We had to build like a diorama because in a museum, people aren't supposed to touch things. And they said, for sure, people are going to touch all these things. You might have a few things missing. So we had to build a diorama. And that was kind of a fun project to figure out how I would enter from the side to set things up. So when I came to set up the ofrenda, that was how, how it looked. They had already um, separated all the photos and articles and scanned them and put them on the wall kind of by different, I guess, chapters in his life. And there is the song of the bluebird that I was telling you about. Um, and the family tablecloth and again, some of the, the sketches. There, There is a... I guess a little bit of a song that goes with song with the song of the bluebird too, which, you know, I, it was probably repainted 15 times in two years. It was kind of me going through something and I wasn't, I don't work from photographs, so I wasn't even sure what it was going to be. <laughs> it just kept morphing into something else. And um, then he showed up as a monarch, you know, and I thought it was going to be a bluebird. It really threw me, <laughs> threw me for a loop, but it stayed song of the bluebird. Um, it's a dialogue about storytelling and great grief uh, that transports us to a place where mythos becomes reality. That's what that painting is about. And the song that he used to sing, I'll, I'll tell you the words in English, wings chase the breeze, a flash of blue. I stopped and I know that it is you. Um, yeah, so there I am um, with the painting, the sketches that you can see the panels on the wall and the ladder grew as we tried to figure out how to hang things. The serape um, there I have up here, it belonged to my grandfather. It's from Saltillo, Mexico. And Saltillo is known for um, their weavings of, of um, serapes. So that I, that's actually here today. Oops, 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 sorry, wrong button. <laughs> there we go. So as you enter this space, um, they did a whole Day of the Dead kind of presentation. There were some um, cutouts on the wall and on the floor, and we're starting to hang things. And uh, again, you can imagine that I was concerned about everything from the font to the, the spacing of everything, where the chairs were going to be, what they were going to block or not block. Uh, and then the other slide there, that was my artist statement about the piece and um, some other pieces of commentary about the uh, ofrenda. Uh, so the papel picado, which you saw in the um, ofrendas from before, from Oaxaca, this is where I deviated a little bit. I didn't want a lot of color in that sense. Um, I had certain things that had hierarchy for me, and so I wanted to pull color from certain things. 
So I decided to have the cut paper white and then I wanted it hung vertically, which turned into a huge challenge because they had to all be unthreaded because they're meant to be hung like a banner and rethreaded so that we could hang them um, horizontally. I had some great help from the museum to make that happen, but my idea was that I wanted it to feel like a cathedral when you entered. So I had different levels of these vertical columns so that it kind of created a cathedral from the door. Um, so here we're hanging the paper and experimenting where things are going to go. You can see in the tray on the far slide that we had printed a lot of butterflies, different scales and different, I guess, uh, flying patterns so that I could put them on the wall um, and kind of secure them. They had a vinyl background and we, we put them up there. Um, here I am putting the butterflies up. And then there were some 3D monarch butterflies uh, that were cut out of wood that were in the actual ofrenda. So just what I learned about the monarch a minute, each fall, like clockwork, clouds of monarchs descend upon the highland forest in central Mexico. Has anybody ever been there to see that? It's on my list. Check it out online. It's absolutely gorgeous. Their arrival marks the conclusion of a 3,000 mile journey a once in a lifetime journey, the butterflies fly south from their summer breeding grounds in Canada and the United States and return to exactly the same spot, these fir forests, as generations did before them. So if you look at the images online, it's just monarch butterflies everywhere, hanging from the trees, from the leaves, um, flying through the, through the streets. So millions of fluttering orange wings blanket the forest, enveloping the branches of central Mexico that they will stay there for the winter months. How the monarch's internal compass navigates them generation after generation to the same overwhelming site is not entirely understood. There are a lot of theories, but to add to the history of the monarch, and this I found out uh, after I was visited by the monarch, that the annual migration coincides with the Day of the Dead. Celebrations and the monarch for thousands of years are thought to be the souls of the departed returning. All right, so um, a couple, this is the actual friend, of course, and you can see objects in there. Uh, the marigolds couldn't put real flowers in either, so <laughs> it was continually, things had to be recreated. So I made some out of paper and cut a lot of tissue paper petals, but uh, the marigold is very important because it's used to guide the ancestors to the altar. As I said, it has a very interesting fragrance and also a bright color. Um, it's believed that the orange in the monarch wings coincides with the orange of this flower. And I scattered the petals uh, all through on the inside there. Um, the orange tree symbolism I talked to you a little bit about. Uh, the chair that's there is mine from when I was a child. And there are different pieces of clothing. Um, so here I am placing the sweet bread, which actually looks pretty good, you know, and free sweet bread, and some candy that's. Uh, made leche camada, we used to call it. It's like burnt milk, goat's milk that has kind of a caramel taste to it is there. And then you can see uh, the molinillo, which is used to make the hot chocolate. It's a beater um, and the chocolate is, usually has a little bit of cinnamon in it. So some of the significant artifacts here um, my dad loved creative projects, and if there wasn't one, he made one. He embraced a state of awareness that I have never met in anyone, of learning, of curiosity, of the possibility of something. That's why I love hardware stores, because he always used to take me, and we could make anything from a hardware store. So many of the objects showed his insatiable curiosity. He was raised in both Mexico and San Antonio, Texas, so my father was always walking two worlds. He was completely bilingual and bicultural, and when I took Spanish in high school, he was quick to point out to me from my teacher, Mr. Polonowski, that language was cultural. 
He practiced his language. He read newspapers and magazines. He was an avid computer person. He was a decoder in World War II, so he constantly had a curiosity with how language changes. And I remember growing up, um, begging to fall asleep on the couch in the living room while he would be practicing his speeches that he was delivering in Washington. He had a reel to reel and he practiced so that both in English and Spanish so that he did not have an accent in either language. Remember I told you he was a perfectionist. Um, he was a tall man, 6'2", and he always stood up straight. That was very important to him. He exercise life, I believe, with a graceful determination that was above the prejudice that shattered his life. I was with him on many occasions that were jaw-dropping in terms of how people spoke. Um, today, I don't think you could get away with those comments, but they were quite, quite overt. But he never responded in a way that was antagonistic. He was always kind of above that. He used to say, eagles don't hunt flies just rise above it and you know work on it on a national level work on it to get something done he was always concerned about clearing a path for others rather than seeing the obstruction and i think these objects reflect this duality the yellow rose of texas which is on this a friend of two i brought brought him during his bedridden years i tried to pick one from my garden today and sadly you know, they're almost getting ready for winter. The petals fell off, so we have the artificial ones again. Um, he would admire that rose like he did everything, like he had seen it for the first time, and point out something truly remarkable about the flower. Um, here's a close-up of one end of the ofrenda. Um, various people he's with, he was with, some letters, various organizations that he belonged to. He was very active in the Small Business Association at the national level. He was the chairman um, of, of a region of the United States, so he could take interests of, of the Latinos that are trying to start small businesses to Washington. Uh, life was a little uneven in the late 60s, um, so I think those voices were really important. Uh, the outfit, the Charo outfit that's there, I have pictures of him in the first, as I said, he started the first cultural parade in Grand Rapids, and I have him in that outfit, and he brought in uh, people on horseback, and it was quite an event, dancing, actually my dress is at the Grand Rapids Museum, because I had, I'm not an, an, uh, one of those kind of people that likes to get up in front of people and dance, but I had to learn the traditional dance, and um, Work, work with other youth in, in teaching that. Um, as I said too, he marched, he, he was a, a civil rights activist. He marched with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta. Um, I grew up boycotting grapes and lettuce and all the other things that I loved. Um, so I think that became a part of who I am and probably is a big part of the artwork that I make today. Um, he took his concerns to Washington. He wasn't satisfied with just at a local level, which he was very active, but um, he was educated. He came to uh, Michigan to go to the University of Michigan uh, and graduated from Aquinas, and he felt that he had a responsibility to take it a, a step further for the people that were still not educated and didn't feel like they had a voice. He created new bills. I have pictures of him signing um, bills. And he pushed for Latin Americans to be counted in the census, as I said, and created the first National Hispanic Scholarship. So um, my father's mother, uh, Sara Lopez Tapia de la Vega, she didn't speak very much English, but I understood her perfectly at all times. She made herself known in the most gentle of ways. She was the great granddaughter of General Santiago Tapia. And if you're interested in history, you can certainly look him up. He not only fought beside Santa Ana at age 13, but was the Brigadier General in the Battle of Puebla on Cinco de Mayo. He was also governor of, of Puebla later. So Cinco de Mayo is the day that we all have a tequila. We're not quite sure why, but it's a lot of fun. 
But it was actually a very important battle because it freed Mexico from Napoleon. And they had already freed themselves, well, what, 50 years before from the Spaniards. So this was a very important event. My dad years ago gave me a copy of these letters from Bonito, Bonito Juarez um, to Santiago Tapia. And again, I heard about him so much growing up, I was very grateful and went to lots of events where he gave these letters to the president of Mexico and different people. Um, but this is mine and it's, it has a little plaque on it to me. So I think it, after he was gone, it actually meant even more. Um, when I put the letters on, on the ofrenda there in the front, I, I, you know, I had kind of a surge of connection with my ancestors, the, the connection that my father always knew. It was that dreaming time, um, the merging of a relationship of all things, past, present, and future. And I, I felt like my ancestry existed all in that one moment. So this is the ofrenda completed. Um, Nothing fell off the wall. That was a good sign. The, the papel picado, which is supposed to move, um, it, it represents air as the element and sort of the spirits being present. There was some, I don't know, a circulation system or something in the room that even in, in it was open at the top, but did allow for that paper to move, which was, was great. There's one more image. You can see the panels of, not too well, but of the history. And I do have a link to the museum if anybody's interested to know more about that. Um, every one of these objects holds an individual story. And I have boxes of things that I didn't use, but to express a life well lived. So over the years, my work as an artist has examined the words often spoken to me by my father. I had a lot of words spoken to me by my father and songs. But he used to say, be sure that when you go, there's a space that said you were here at all. So I hope that you'll take um, in these artifacts that I have today and have shown you um, about Francisco Vega, fondly known as Pancho. As you consider the overlapping traditional symbolism of this ofrenda, you might pause to reflect on the borrowed light that is a part of all of us when life is lived to the fullest. So I have a, a quick interview from um, the event in Grand Rapids last year. Let's see if I can do this. Dia de los Muertos is a beloved Mexican holiday that's celebrated by many different people. And it's all about honoring our loved ones who passed away. A local artist set up a special display at the Grand Rapids Public Museum next to me, honoring her father, who's also a civil rights icon. An ofrenda means an offering. Um, so this is an ofrenda from my father uh, called Borrowed Light. Uh, homage to my father. Francisco Miguel Nava Vega Lopez Tapia, known to many as Francisco Vega, but to artist Margaret Vega, he was simply dead. He passed away last year at 99 years old, but she says 100 because he always rounded up. He died, I was holding his hand, so I was caring for him in the last months of his life, but um, definitely a hero for me and a hero to many in West Michigan, she says, having spent his life fighting for civil rights for Latinos. After five months of planning and digging through 30 boxes, Margaret created this altar for Ofrenda commemorating his work. He fought for civil rights alongside of Cesar Chavez. He worked with three or four presidents in Washington, D.C. and uh, created the first National Scholarship Association for Latino students. She says he advised Presidents Kennedy, Nixon, Reagan, Ford, and Bush Sr. on issues impacting the Latino community. Everything from discrimination, bilingual education, and voting rights. He was a fighter in a very dignified way. He made a lot of speeches around the state and in Washington numerous times to bring uh, civil rights issues to the government fighting power because he experienced it firsthand at a young age. He started this fight, you know, with World War II 
and not being admitted into the service because they were not taking Mexican Americans at that time. But he persisted and was later admitted. He went on to study at the University of Michigan at Aquinas, but the white man, consisting of his family and the fight for civil rights, never died. Some of his words to me were, just make sure when you're gone there's a hole there that says that you were here at all. And I think he lived life that way. Again, she says her father stood up for everything he believed in. It's something that inspired her and her work. And if you would like to see the open and the entire exhibit, it's open right now at the Grand Rapids Public Museum next to me. And she says on September 29th, there's going to be a special reception in honor of the open end up. Recorded here in Grand Rapids, going out to the spot 17 years. So I'm, I'm just going to finish with the ofrenda that I told you that I have at home, and certainly it's it's not difficult, it's not as elaborate as what's here, and you can can do this for anybody that you want to remember. Um, I put things by it every day, as I said, um, and it changes, so this was what it looked like. Um, I have some of his medals, religious medals that he carried in during World War II, and of course some candles. Uh, the story that she said, uh, I'll end with this, uh, two stories. You know, um, of course, cultural um, prejudice and how people look is still part of our daily conversation, I am sad to say. But when my parents fell in love, my mother was at Bradley University and my dad was there for World War II training for special forces because what happened is they turned him down and he enlisted because he got calls from his family, um, from relatives, from the general that said, you know, we're at war and you need to, you need to volunteer. So my dad did. He went to every branch of the military and nobody would take him. Um, he had background in military school, so he kept applying, kept applying. What happened is they brought all of these guys in and they didn't have anybody to train them. So they put out an advertisement in the newspaper that they needed anybody that had any kind of military training to come in and train the people that they took in for World War II. So my dad was admitted that way and he was um, an incredibly fast typist. So he was right away separated to go to the special services to do decoding. Um, and so he was at Bradley in this special ops training. And my mom, one of her friends said, oh, you know, they watched them march through campus every day. My mom said, you know, we were all kind of impressed with these guys. And so she was set up on a blind date with my dad and they fell in love. Um, and were married for 75 years, but her parents wouldn't, wouldn't put the blessing on the marriage. So when my dad came back, um, she left her home in Peoria, Illinois, and he was in Texas. They met in Kansas City where he met somebody in the service that was their best man, and, and they eloped. They got married. She got a train, got on a train from Chicago where she was working, um, and her parents didn't speak to her for five years. So I and she, her sister, you know, everybody kind of took sides. So that's that's a great story because they, they were happily married for a long time. Um, and then the other one is about World War II. As I said, he he ended up at the top of the Eiffel Tower and decoding um, and was on D-Day beaches and the Battle of the, Bel the Bulge came back very decorated. Um, I have some of his medals up here. And I always thought that was kind of an interesting full circle, you know, that he was not allowed to get in, but then did so much for the country um, through his military service. He was always very proud of that. And I think I only understood that when I started doing some history checks on uh, General Santiago Tapia. I guess obviously this, this ancestry is really important. All right. Um, I think we have some minutes minutes for some questions if anybody has anything that they would like to ask or share or thank you for listening it was a little longer than i intended yes you have a second wife? Um, no he just had my mother just one wife so they were married for 75 years and she's still alive she just turned 100 september 6th <laughs> So, but she um, still sits by the ofrenda where he was and says that she feels him there. She um, was was a real supporter as well. She had to deal with, of course, the 
the, the comments and the racism and the separateness that happens when you marry somebody that's that's different than how you were raised. Um, and she was very involved in politics in her own right. That answered the question or? So the question is, what is my my family's relationship with Catholicism? And very eloquently, you elaborate on some different parts of that. Well, I was raised Catholic. Catholicism, as you know, is very strong in the uh, Latino, Mexican, Spanish-speaking world. Um, my father had an interesting relationship with Catholicism. He went to Catholic schools, and he tells a story about how his parents really had to sacrifice so that he could go to the Catholic school as opposed to the school that was in the neighborhood, which was not as good. Um, and he did some, he taught himself how to draft. So he designed several different things from his drafting uh, cemeteries for some churches. And then towards, you know, the Catholic church also had its own issues with not allowing people in or things being very particular in the Catholic Church. So I, I'm afraid that he also faced some racism within the Catholic Church that was difficult. Um, I have his rosary up here, his mother and my great grandmother, who is the great granddaughter of General Santiago Tapia, also went to mass every morning. So, um, and walked, you know. Um, so the relationship is there. I think some of the man-made components of Catholicism, maybe he set aside so that he could appreciate the, the greater picture. He went to the cathedral in downtown Grand Rapids quite a bit. And I remember walking in probably the last couple of weeks of his life and he was doing the rosary, which was kind of, you know, saying the rosary, which I hadn't seen him do in a while. And I started talking, I didn't see what he was doing. And he looks at me and he goes, shh. <laughs> I was like, okay, you're in, you're in your zone here. So um, yeah, does that answer what you're thinking in terms Sure. Any other questions? So you mentioned that you had all these artifacts in your studio. How did that, tell us more how that affected your work at that time and maybe you possibly even your work today. Um, so the question is, how did the artifacts that I was storing in my studio for the ofrenda affect my work? Um, well, I was, I was working on that painting, The Song of the Bluebird, that changed so many times because I, I was changing. I was painting it in the process, and I guess it is a bit of a self-portrait standing in those boots with all that muck around me. But, um, you know, I, I talked to him, I think. Yeah, so I think he became, um, I also, my son sort of commissioned me to do a painting. I think he just wanted to keep me painting. Um, I did a large piece, uh, probably five feet by seven and a half feet, um, called Underwater. That was basically how I felt. It was if, if you were underwater and all the different striations of blue. Um, so I, I think I worked through a lot of my grief with my father in my studio. And of course, that's where the monarch appeared, was right by the door by my studio. <laughs> So any other questions? Well, you've been very kind to listen so long. And um, if you think of anything, I'm going to be around cleaning up the ofrenda for a little while. So feel free to, to ask me anything. But thank you for coming.